morning, church. Yes, welcome to the 11, 1030 service. Please stand and uh, join me in prayer as we prepare for worship. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this gorgeous day. And uh, we just pray that uh, as we go through changes as a church, that we just ever feel your presence in here. And just guide us through this service. Help us to become closer to you. Help us to become stronger in our walk. And just uh, may every word that we sing and say and do, and just bless the message from Pastor Ray as well. We just be, may this all be pleasing to you. For in Jesus' name, everyone says.
Father in heaven, we give you our great praise and honor this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Your body broken for us, broken people, broken lives. And Lord, you come to restore us, to restore us to relationship with you, relationship with each other, uh, to re renew our lives. We thank you, Lord, and we give you our praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take a moment before you're seated just to turn around and uh, welcome those around you in the sanctuary. Welcome once again. I'm Pastor Ray. We're so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, if this is your first time here with us on a Sunday morning, we extend a special welcome to you. Here we go. Probably works better if I get my mic on, huh? We extend a special welcome to you. We uh, just trust that God's going to speak to you in a very special way uh, through the service this morning. I'd like to share just a couple of announcements with you as we get started. Uh, we are into our new fall schedule. And uh, as the uh, COVID cases begin to take a turn down in the community, we're so glad to see that. We hope that that continues. Uh, we will start opening up more and more activities here at the church as well. So keep an eye on the church calendar. 
Uh, we do have uh, one brand new activity starting this afternoon, though. We're so excited about it. Hope for Kids, a brand new kids and a family ministry. Uh, I think we have 30 kids signed up. That's at 3 p.m. this afternoon. Please be praying for this as uh, we, uh, we launch something new for the uh, kids and families uh, in our church. And then just a reminder that uh, we have switched over to our new church software now. We are in the month of September. Uh, we're, we're flushing out the old system. And uh, so if you haven't signed up for an account yet or, or signed up on that uh, new church app and you don't know how, talk to us, call us. We'll get you set up on that. And especially if you are uh, one of the many people in our church who do online giving, uh, if you're still giving through the old system, we need you to switch that over to the new system. Uh, the old system is going to be uh, completely shut down. And once again, if you have any questions on that, talk to us. We'll step you through uh, that process. Uh, that's all of our announcements at this time. Our uh, scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, uh, verses 15 through 18. The words will be up on the screen for you. And uh, let me uh, read this for you. It ties in with our message uh, later this morning. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is God's holy word. We're going to present a song to you, a new song uh, called The Blessing, and if you know it, feel free to sing along. In the morning, in the evening, in your 
coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. 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 Our missionary prayer focus this week is Walter and Diane Kennedy. Uh, Walter and Diane are our missionaries to Indonesia. Uh, although as many of you know, they are not in Indonesia right now. They're back here in the United States, which is wonderful. We got to see them just a couple months ago. Uh, they came back to spend some time with uh, their son and daughter-in-law and their brand new grandchild. And uh, Diane is also here undergoing tests and uh, further treatment for her cancer. And uh, so I know they would appreciate your prayers for them. If you remember them in prayer this week, be praying especially for the ministry back in Indonesia in their absence, and be praying for a Diane for God's continued healing in her life. Now let's go to the Lord together now in prayer as a family. Well, Lord, as we come before you in prayer this morning, uh, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father uh, who hears all of our requests as we bring them to you in Jesus' name. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for the way that we've seen you answer our prayers again and again uh, over the years. Lord, I want to lift up a number in our church family in need of prayer today. I lift up Charlene Finney as Charlene is uh, still recovering from COVID. And uh, we just pray that you would be with her and uh, continue to heal her, uh, help her to get over the, uh, the lagging symptoms. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We've had a, a number of families in our church uh, uh, fighting COVID. And we thank you that uh, uh, most, uh, if not all of them now, have recovered. Uh, we pray for those who are still experiencing some symptoms, especially the coughing, and, and Lord, we just pray that you would bring them complete healing uh, at this time. Lord, I lift up Dot Vaughn to you. Uh, Dot took a fall this week, and it uh, uh, looks like she may have hit her head. She's in Broward General. Uh, we pray for Dot, Lord. We've been praying for her for recovery from her shoulder surgery. Now, Lord, we just uh, pray that you'd be with her, be with those who are attending to her. Uh, Lord, we just uh, pray that you would uh, uh, heal whatever uh, it needs to be healed, and we just uh, ask for your uh, presence and spirit to be with her. We continue praying for Pastor Chip and Barbara Plank. We continue praying for your healing for Pastor Chip. We ask your blessing upon their household. Lord, as we look outside our church and around the world, we continue praying for the people of Afghanistan. And uh, Lord, we pray particularly for the Christians in Afghanistan who are uh, fearing persecution at this time. Uh, Lord, this is a communion Sunday, and we pray for all of our brothers and sisters around the world who are experiencing persecution. And we ask that you would help them, be with them, strengthen them, protect them, deliver them. Lord, we also pray for the people of Haiti, and uh, Lord, as they recover from the earthquake, and the people of New Orleans and New York and New Jersey, many who've lost loved ones, uh, Lord, many who've lost property, and uh, Lord, we just uh, pray for the, uh, the rescue and the rebuilding efforts and in all of these areas. And finally, Lord, we do lift up our missionaries to you. We thank you for Walter and Diane. We ask your blessing upon them uh, during this time that they are, are home and in the States. We uh, uh, pray, Lord, that they would enjoy time uh, with Ryan and Mandy and with their grandchildren. And Lord, we do pray for Diane. We uh, thank you for uh, the promising results they've seen in the most recent test where the numbers are moving in the right direction. We pray we would see more of that. And Lord, we pray for her complete healing. We pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you please take your Bibles at this time and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. We are in Matthew chapter 18 and verses 15 
through 20. Our message series is called Jesus the Master Teacher, and we're looking at a series of Jesus' teachings as found in uh, Matthew chapters 18 through 20. Uh, last week, we looked at Jesus' parable of the lost sheep, and uh, we saw that God seeks after the wandering believer, and therefore, so should we, right? But you know, there's a right way to do that and a wrong way to seek the wanderer. And so here now, in, in our text today, Jesus gives us the best way to approach this. And so uh, this is wonderful teaching for us this morning. Uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 20. I'm just going to read uh, verses 15, 16, and 17 as we get started. Will you please stand with me for the reading of God's word? The words of Jesus, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Well, dear Lord, this is another one of those challenging uh, sections of Scripture. And so we need your help to uh, hear your word this morning, Lord, to receive your word and allow it to shape our lives as you desire. So, Lord Jesus, we submit ourselves to you. Holy Spirit, come speak to our hearts through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So our passage before us today uh, raises this question. When someone sins in the body of Christ, how should you respond? How should the church respond? You know, there are four basic ways that churches respond to known sin in their midst. They're not all good. Uh, the first is indifference. Uh, this is when the church says things like, well, you know what? We all sin. We can't be judgmental. You know, it's none of my business. It's a person's private life. But, you know, that response is neither loving nor is it scriptural. The second way churches sometimes respond is with self-righteousness. And that's when they go the other way, right? When they respond with an air of superiority or a judgmental attitude. Of course, that's not good either. A third way churches sometimes respond is with malice. By spreading gossip or slander about the person. Obviously, that one's no good. And then there's the fourth way, and that's the way that Jesus outlines for us today in our passage. When a church responds with loving concern and a desire to restore the brother or sister to fellowship with Christ. You might wonder, well, why don't we take the restore path more often, right? And that's because it involves something very uncomfortable for us, and that's something called confrontation. And none of us like confrontation. Confrontation, but you cannot restore without confronting. And you know, the church is in trouble when it will neither confess nor confront sin. And so Jesus gives us these instructions. He tells us, what do you do when a fellow believer sins, and especially when they sin against you? Right? That's the toughest of all. What do you do? You know, there's an outline in your worship guide this morning. I'd encourage you to take it out at this time to follow along. You'll see the various points of the message there, the scriptures we'll be looking at, and there's room to jot down some notes as well. And you'll see the very first thing there is follow the process. Follow the process. First thing you need to do is follow the process which Jesus lays out for us here in our verses. Now, I'm going to read verses 15 through 17 again. We opened our message with it, but the, we're going to look more deeply into them now. Now that you know what these verses are about, listen to them again. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, Treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So these are Jesus' words to us. He outlines this process. There are four steps in this process. Uh, those are four steps that need to be taken in order. 
Uh, Jesus is very clear here. And the very first step is one that we could call go and show. Okay, not show and tell or not go and tell. Go and show, right? Jesus says you should go to the person who has sinned against you and you should show him his fault just between the two of you. I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus calls this person your brother. In other words, we have a family relationship within the body of Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, right? We share one heavenly father. You know, it's bad enough when friends separate, how much worse when brothers or sisters don't get along. Now we need to practice discernment and we need to balance this instruction out with other scriptures. For example, we read in Proverbs 19 verse 11, it says this, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. And so with smaller sins and smaller offenses, we just bear with each other. You're patient. You, those are things that we can overlook. And so Jesus is not speaking about those small matters or offenses here. Rather, he is talking here about serious or repeated sin where there's a breach in the relationship or the person is causing damage to their Christian testimony or where their sin is holding them back from growing in Christ. Jesus says, when that's the case, okay, when that's happening, he says, you go. He says, you take the initiative. Don't wait for them to come to you. He says, you go. Don't go to nitpick, okay? Don't go to vent or to dump. Don't go to spew out angry or bitter words. Jesus says, no, go and show them their fault. And you know the words that are translated, show them their fault here. It's a word which means bring to light. Bring to light. Jesus uses the exact same word in John 16, 8, when he speaks of the Holy Spirit bringing conviction of sin. What does the Holy Spirit do? He brings the sin to light. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, go to them and shine the light of God's word on the situation, therefore allowing the Holy Spirit to convict them of sin. And how does Jesus say you should go? What should your manner be? Galatians 6.1 tells us, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. And so the Bible tells us we should go in a spirit of gentleness and humility, realizing that we also are sinful, we also can be tempted, but also knowing that our brother or sister needs our loving correction. Notice something else. Boy, there's a whole lot packed into this first step, right? Notice that Jesus says this first step is between you and him alone. Boy, what an important instruction, right? Right? You know, we usually tell everyone but the person involved. You know, Jesus says, don't do that. He says, go and show him as a fault just between the two of you. Do you know why privacy is so important in this step? There are several reasons I can think of. First of all, first of all, you're giving the person an opportunity to explain themselves, right? Maybe it's just been a big misunderstanding. So give the person the benefit of the doubt. Just go to them, the two of you. Secondly, if it's a private matter, then it's nobody else's business. Hopefully, you guys can just settle it together. And then thirdly, there's no need to spread dirty laundry around. It only hurts the cause of Christ and the witness of the church. So, if someone comes to you complaining about how so-and-so in the church has hurt or offended them, what's your first question? What's the first thing you say? You say... Have you talked with them, right? We direct them to this first step. Jesus says we are responsible for our own person-to-person relationships within the body of Christ. You know the great thing about this step is when you you follow Jesus' process, this first step, it's very often the last step. That's as far as you need to go. That's what Jesus says. He says, if your brother listens to you, you've won him over. See, that's the whole purpose of this process, to win your brother or sister back. 
not to lose them. There's a reason this comes after the parable of the lost sheep, the one who's wandered away. They're lost. You want to win them back. You want to be reconciled. You want to restore them to fellowship and service to the Lord. So that's all in the first step, right? Go and show them the fault just between the two of you. If they listen, you've won them over, which is the whole goal anyways. But what if he or she does not listen when you go to them? Well, that's when Jesus says you move on to step number two. Jesus says, but if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Uh, If he won't listen, that is if there's no repentance or acknowledgement of sin, then you take this next step. First you go and show, now Jesus says you take with you one or two more. You might be wondering, well, why do we take others with us? Once again, several reasons. First of all, it it, it elevates this matter, doesn't it? It takes the whole situation to a, a whole new level of seriousness. It says this is an important matter that needs to be addressed. Notice that the people that you bring with you join in the effort of reaching out to the wanderer. That's what Jesus says. He says that the person will not listen to them. So they're not meant just to be bystanders, but they are participants. They join with you in reaching out to this brother and trying to reach them and bring them to repentance. And they're also there as witnesses. Not so much witnesses of the, the initial wrong that was committed. They weren't there for that. But they are witnesses of the person's attitude when they are confronted. This is preparatory for the next step if the person is still unrepentant. You know, it was an Old Testament principle that every matter must be established by two or three witnesses. This was necessary to guard against gossip or rumors. Jesus emphasizes the importance of witnesses to firmly establish the matter at hand, which is primarily, once again, either the repentance or the lack of repentance of the person being confronted. You know, that's how important it is to keep the circle tight here. You know, only two or three witnesses are required. We shouldn't be legalistic about this and say, well, no no more than three ever should go. But the principle here is that no more should be involved than absolutely necessary. Because if they repent, if they listen, it doesn't have to go any further. And it shouldn't go any further. Who do you pick to go with you? Well, someone spiritually mature perhaps a close friend, certainly someone whom the person you're going to visit, someone that they, who they know, that they trust and respect. And once again, if, they, if he or she listens at this point, that means you've won them over. But if they still won't listen, even when you've brought two or three with you, you go to the third step. Jesus says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. That phrase uh, refuses to listen in this verse. This is an interesting one. Literally it means this, to listen to one's, to listen to the side. To listen. You can always picture the person, you're talking to them, they're just like, you know, they, they just turn away from you. They don't want to hear it. There's no repentance in their heart. They're just ignoring what you say. Jesus says if, if he refuses to listen to them, if they listen to the side, tell it to the church. Okay, now, Next thing, real important, okay? I need everybody's attention now. If you've been drifting a little bit, come back in. This one's so important. Tell it to the church does not mean that you send out a mass chain email to everyone in the church telling them what's going on, okay? It does not mean that you go and post it on the church Facebook page, okay? That's not what tell it to the church means. The word church means assembly, but you know it can also designate the leadership of the assembly. And that's what Jesus means here. Now is the right time to go to your pastor. If you came to me in step number one and said, so-and-so is sinning against me, they've offended me, they've hurt me, the first thing I'm going to ask is, did you talk to them, right? Right? And if you didn't, I'm going to say, go to step number one. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200. Go there. Get back to me when we're up to step number three. But you've done this, okay? You've tried to settle it yourselves. You've brought two or three witnesses along who can confirm the issue. Now it's the time for the pastor or the pastors of the church to go to the person and try to work things out. Now the pastors may or may not make this issue public to the whole church. 
In most cases, they won't, at least at this step, because that would not be appropriate. Although there are circumstances where they must. For example, the Bible says that when leaders in the church sin, they are to be rebuked publicly. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. It says, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. There's our witnesses again. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take warning. So you've done this now. You've confronted the person yourself. You've brought two or three witnesses along. You've even brought it to the pastor. The pastor's gone to them. What if the person doesn't even listen to the pastor? Jesus says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. This is tough. Let's talk about this. A pagan was someone outside the Christian faith. The tax collector represents someone who is outside the fellowship. So Jesus is saying here that when a brother or sister sins and refuses to repent, even when you've gone through all of these steps with them, Jesus says you should no longer treat them as a Christian, but as a non-believer, as someone outside the church. Now, does that mean that you should be mean to them? Of course not. I hope you're not mean to your non-Christian friends. If you are, stop that, okay? You know, you know we're not mean to non-believers just because they're non-believers. But it would certainly mean removal from church membership and a withdrawing from Christian fellowship. The important thing to notice here is that without repentance, forgiveness is withheld. We sometimes get this fuzzy idea of forgiveness that we should, we should just forgive all people all the time, no matter what they've done, doesn't matter what their attitude is. But Jesus forbids the church from forgiving when there is a lack of repentance. If the person is sinning, the worst thing the church can do is go through all these steps and say, oh, well, you know, you wouldn't listen to the person you hurt, you, you wouldn't listen to the team, you wouldn't even listen to your pastor, but you know what, we'll just forget about it then, and we'll just pretend that nothing ever happened. Can't do that, right? Now, it doesn't mean that you should hold any bitterness in your heart. There's never any place for that. But where there is no repentance, Jesus says there is no public forgiveness. Some people would say, well, how dare you remove someone? from membership in the church. What right do you have to do that? Well, we're gonna look at that right in just a moment when we get to verse 18. But stop and think about it for a minute, okay? Our church has a church covenant, which all members sign and agree to when they join, and part of that covenant is we commit to living a godly life together and, and in fellowship with each other in the church. You know, and if a person comes to join the church and they see the covenant, they say, well, I don't wanna live a godly life. I don't wanna live in fellowship with people in the church. We say, well, then why do you want to be a member? That's what membership is all about, right? And if a person no longer desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, if they no longer want to live in fellowship with the church, then why remain in membership? That's what membership is. Removal from membership, withdrawal from the body, this is a serious step. It should not be taken until all the other steps have been taken carefully, prayerfully and in order. And the toughest part of all of this, I'm sure you heard it too, this toughest part is this withdrawing of Christian fellowship. That hurts us, right? Because we're one body of Christ. We don't want to withdraw Christian fellowship. I want to note a couple things from some other scriptures that give us some more insight into this. First of all, note that it's not, it's not the unbelievers, it's not non-Christians that we're supposed to withdraw from but rather those who claim to be Christians but are living a sinful lifestyle with no repentance. We read this in 1 Corinthians 5. Paul says, I've written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But no, I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, a believer, a Christian. They call themselves that, but they are sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat or, or share in Christian fellowship. Why does God tell us to withdraw our fellowship in this manner? There are two reasons. One, it's for the good of the individual. And number two, it's for the good of the church. 
First, we do it for the good of the individual. We read this in 2 Thessalonians 3. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him. Here's that withdrawing now. Why? In order that he may, he may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. What's the goal here? It's to, the goal is to bring about an appropriate response in the person, which is repentance for sin. So it's for the good of the individual. It's also for the good of the church. Remember, we looked at 1 Timothy 5.20 just a bit earlier, which says, those who sin, speaking of elders, are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take warning. The direct context is elders, but you know, sometimes it has to be brought public to the whole church. Uh, church discipline serves as a warning to others. It serves as a warning to others in the church so that we all may exercise repentance for our sins. And then what do you do if this all works, if the discipline works. You know, we now know what to do when our brother sins, but what do you do when he repents, right? Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. See, there's no bitterness here. There's no resentment in the heart from start to finish. The goal has always been this, restoration, reconciliation. As we saw last week with the parable of the lost sheep, when the lost sheep comes home, there's rejoicing. Everybody rejoices. You know, we asked the question earlier, what right does the church have to withhold forgiveness from someone who is unrepentant? What right does the church have? Well, that authority has been granted to the church by none other than Jesus Christ himself. So now we come to verse 18 in our text, which speaks about binding and loosing. Verse 18, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now this whole idea of binding and loosing re relates back to church discipline and forgiveness. We spoke about this a couple chapters back in Matthew, Matthew 16, uh, where Jesus said something similar to Peter. He said, Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We saw that that related to the gospel confession, confessing that Jesus is the Messiah. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing here has to do with the process of forgiving or withholding forgiveness with regards to sin, it has to do with the process of removing or restoring a brother with regards to church discipline, church membership. Jesus said something similar to his disciples in John 20, 23. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Once again, that's in the context of the keys of the kingdom, the gospel. We can tell anybody who puts their trust in Jesus as Savior, we can say, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. We can tell anybody who says, well, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't trust in Jesus. We can tell them, your sins are not forgiven. What Jesus is saying is that God will approve and confirm in heaven godly decisions made by the church here on earth. Now, when we do this, when we treat someone as an unbeliever who is, who is formerly in the church, does that mean that the person has lost their salvation? I don't believe so. I don't believe it's possible to lose your salvation. Remember, we talked about this last week. We saw that God is the good shepherd, right, in that parable, the good shepherd who always finds his wandering sheep every time. If it's one of you sheep and they're wandering off, he always brings them back. But the Bible also does not give anyone assurance of salvation when there's no repentance for sin in your life. And so when we're told to treat the unrepentant person as a non-believer, it's not merely symbolic here, okay? We must face the possibility that this person may not be saved at all. The reason we treat them as an unbeliever is because they may, in fact, actually be an unbeliever. Only God really knows, but Jesus did say, by their fruits, you will know them. Another thing I want you to note about verse 18 is that this verse is directed to the church, not to individuals. 
There are three yous. The word you shows up three times uh, in verse 18. You know what? They are all plural yous. He's speaking to the church. To whom is this power given? Not just to Peter, not to the pastor as an individual. It is given to the church and its appointed leaders. That's why when Paul instructs the Corinthians about removing someone from the church, he says, do it when you are all assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus. And this protects the church from from some bad pastors out there, okay? Some power-hungry pastors or some loose cannons. You know, we read about one of them in in the book of 3 John, a guy named Diotrephes, who John says loved to be first, apparently also loved putting people out of the church. He just kind of had that power trip going. And so Jesus, yes, he gives the church the right to accept and remove people from membership, but this right must always be tempered with prayer, with the church seeking God's will together in prayer and in the presence and in the name of Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our final two verses, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus talks to us about agreeing in prayer. Again, Jesus said, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, It will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, very important, there am I with them. Now there's both a general principle in these verses as well as a specific application. Let's look at the general principle first. The general principle just has to do with praying together in Jesus' name. You read verse 19, at first it almost seems to be an automatic gimme, right? You run something real bad in your life, just got to find one other person to agree with you, pray together, and then God has to do it. Okay, that's not what that verse is saying. It seems that way at first. But you know, those who love God, those who worship God, uh, we know that prayer is so much more wonderful and meaningful than that. Prayer is not some giant celestial vending machine. Get two people together, pull the slot, and God has to give you whatever it was, even if it's something terrible or damaging or harmful. No, notice the gathering and the prayer are what they are in Jesus' name. It's in his name. Jesus says something similar in John chapter 16. He says, I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Those words in Jesus' name, it's not a magic formula, okay? What that means is that we gather in his presence, we gather under his authority, seeking his will and his ways, seeking to be obedient to his word. And when you're doing that, Jesus says, even the smallest gathering, he's there with you. Because the church is in some sense gathered. Now we'll take those general statements Jesus made about prayer and we apply them to our subject. That's where Jesus is applying them here. To the church's removal of a member, to church discipline. All church discipline must be done in an attitude of humility and prayer. Under Christ's authority, seeking his will in the matter. Because then and only then will God bind in heaven what has been bound on earth. Only then will he loose in heaven what has been loosed on earth. Let me close with five words of specific application this morning. You might want to jot these down. Number one, love. Love. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love them enough to care about their sin. Love them enough to confront and to go through the steps. Number two, desire purity in the church. We are the church. Remember, we are the bride of Christ. Jesus is coming back for us. Jesus gave himself for us. Why? In order to purify us. And that's one of the reasons we practice Discipline in the church is to protect the purity of the church. Number three, follow God's instructions. Follow God's instructions. Do not spread rumors, slander, don't gossip. Go to the person first. Take the other steps as needed. Do so with a gentle spirit, a spirit of love and humility. Two more applications. Number four, keep your own heart soft and repentant towards God. You ever think about that? We even think about the other person who sinned. What if it's you? What if you're the one who's living in unrepentant sin? What if you're the one who's offended a brother or sister in the church? If someone approaches you about your sin, immediately repent and be reconciled. 
You know, if we all did this, there would never be any need for steps two, three, and four. We would all be taken care of right away. And then our fifth application this morning is do not rest in a false assurance of salvation if you have unrepentant sin in your life. Do not rest in a false assurance of salvation if you have unrepentant sin in your life. God approves in heaven those decisions made under his authority by the church on earth. Don't take unrepentant sin in your life lightly. When you refuse to repent, that that is a strong indication that you possibly may not be saved. That's the whole reason why the church is to withhold forgiveness when there's no repentance. Because maybe you're not saved and you need to come to Christ. Or if you are saved, you certainly need to repent and be restored to fellowship. Although, as we'll see next week, oh, I love next week's passage. This one's a tough one. But next week, next week we'll see that we are to exercise unlimited forgiveness when there's repentance. When the person repents, no limit to the forgiveness. Come back next week. You don't want to miss that one. God seeks the wanderer, and therefore, so should we. We should seek to restore the wandering believer who has sinned against us by following the process Jesus has laid out for us. If we don't follow the process, we may actually end up doing more harm than good, right? But when we follow what Jesus told us to do, and we follow those steps, we give the wanderer the very best opportunity to repent of their sin and be restored to fellowship with Jesus in his church. Or to put it as simply as I can this morning, ready for this? No sheep left behind, okay? No sheep left behind. God seeks the wanderer, and so should we. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Well, dear Lord, as we uh, receive your instruction this morning, Uh, Lord, we're still stuck because it's hard for us to confront. It's hard for us to do these things. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us. And, Lord, you would help us as a church uh, to love each other enough to care about sin and to bring the wandering sheep back to the fold, as you've instructed us to do. Help us to do these things in a way that are pleasing to you and will be beneficial to each other, to the church as a whole. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord's table is before us this morning, a a sign of the fellowship we share together as believers. In preparation for that, I invite you to stand as uh, we sing a song of praise and worship.
It's a special time the first Sunday of each month when we gather around the Lord's table to share communion with each other. Uh, the bread representing Christ's body broken for us, the cup representing his blood shed for us. We practice what we call an open communion at our church. That simply means you do not need to be a member of our church to share in communion with us today. Uh, all we ask is that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and you are seeking to follow him in your life. And if that's true of you this morning, we encourage you, we invite you to share uh, communion with us this morning as a sign of our fellowship together in Jesus Christ. The Bible says before partaking of the bread and the cup that each person should examine uh, themselves. And so we're going to take for just a few moments in silent prayer. This is a time for you to confess sin to God, uh, to repent of that sin, to receive his forgiveness so that you may take communion and leave this morning with a, a clean conscience uh, and the joy of knowing your sins washed clean and forgiven. Let's go before the Lord together in silent prayer to confess our sins to him. Lord, your word gives us this beautiful assurance that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes, what I receive from the Lord Jesus, I pass on also to you. It was on the night that our Lord is betrayed that he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. There's a small cup in the uh, pew rack ahead of you. There's a clear label at the top. If you just lift up that label and uh, remove that wafer, if you just hold that in your hands uh, as Anne plays some music for us to reflect on Christ's sufferings for us, uh, what it means that Christ's body was broken uh, for our sins. Christ's body was broken for you and for me. Let us share the bread together. And at the supper, Jesus takes a cup and he tells his disciples that this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood that will be poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he tells his, his disciples that as, as often as you drink from this cup, to do so in remembrance of me. On this pull tab system, you, if you pull back that second film, you'll have the juice. Before we partake together, we want to play the music, the instrumentals that Anne will lead us in and reflect on the blood that Christ has shed for us. Christ's blood was shed for you and for me. Let us share the cup together.
communion meal that we share together. We thank you for what it represents, the forgiveness that we have in Christ. Lord Jesus, we look forward to your coming again. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We will be with you forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. After that first Lord's Supper, the Bible tells us they sang a hymn together before they left. And so if we will all please stand together. And if you're with a family member and you'd like to hold hands, we'll sing Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful day in the Lord.